Let's get ready to grumble! Well, the budget I'm releasing today sends a clear message to the American people that we've what we value. First, fiscal responsibility. Second, safety and security. And thirdly, the excuse me, the investments needed to build a better America. But we still spend what we need to spend to continue to fight COVID. But those expenditures will be dramatically less than last year. For most Americans, the last few years were very hard, stretching them to the breaking point. But billionaires and large corporations got richer than ever. Right now, billionaires pay an average rate of 8% on their total income. 8%, that's the average they pay. Now, I'm a capitalist, but uh, just, I want, I, I, if you can make a billion bucks, great. Just pay your fair share. Pay a little bit. A firefighter and a teacher pay more than double, double the tax rate that a billionaire pays. That's not right. That's not fair. In addition to dealing with terrorist organizations, for the second quarter of the 21st century, we're once again facing increased competition from other nation states, China and Russia, which are going to require investments to make things like space and cyber and other advanced capabilities, including, including hypersonics. And this will be among the largest investments in our national security in history. Some people don't like the increase, but we're in a different world today. America is more prosperous, more successful, and more just when it is more secure. So first things first, the Nord Stream 2 cost approximately $11 billion to build this pipeline from Russia to Germany. This thing is loaded with fuel and ready to rock and roll. And there's lots and lots of contracts on the books right now to fulfill with this gas and petroleum. But these sanctions are there and there's all this problem because Russia has come back and said, no gas for you without having payment in rubles. While Germany is saying, hey, hell with that, man. We want to be able to pay in euros because that's what the contract states Putin's like, nah, no, nah, we're not going to take foreign currencies. You guys have to go through a step-by-step -step process to be able to transfer your euros into rubles because they're only accepting payment in rubles and gold. Well, you can't really pay in gold per se. So what you have to do is you would have to pay, like transfer the shit through some sort of massive process where the bank sells these things out on the open market, comes back in and transfers it into rubles. And there's like a whole seven step process for this thing. It's ridiculous. Bloomberg saying, oh, it's crazy. It's almost impossible to understand. Everybody's flailing around trying to figure out how to do this. Bottom line is this. Russia holds the oil, period, full stop. Europe needs the oil, full stop. How is Europe going to get it taken care of? How are they going to be able to take care of all their petroleum needs? Well, the U.S. is there trying to run roughshod behind the back, trying to get things done. But Boris Johnson went to Saudi Arabia trying to get a couple extra barrels of oil. And they said, uh, no, no, not going to do it. And the U.S., they're wondering if the U.S. will go out there, Jolton Joe Biden, go out there and talk to Saudi Arabia and say, hey, Riyadh, give us some more oil. Chances are they're going to say no. So the U.S. is about to pump a million gallons a day out to them to try to help facilitate their transition away from Russian oil. But guess what? The problem is it's going to be super, super freaking expensive to do this. But expensive in terms of what? Expensive in terms of dollars? Eh. Expensive in terms of euros? Eh. It's going to be expensive in terms of getting it there to begin with. We have got tons and tons and tons of needs all throughout Europe, right, to get this fuel in there. And sure enough, right there under the Baltic Sea, they've got the Nord 2 uh, stream uh, pipeline waiting to happen. Filled to the rim with brim, filled to the rim with lots of gas and not being turned on. So Russia, having this asset sitting there waiting to give it away, is positioning itself quite honestly on a geopolitical scale that you don't recognize.
Netherlands. We need to reassess the situation also with regard to Nord Stream 2. I have asked the Federal Ministry of Economics to uh, look at the to withdraw the report on the security of supply with the Federal um, Networks Agency. It sounds a bit technocratic, but this is the first necessary step to make sure that this pipeline cannot be certified at this point in time. And without this certification, Nord Stream 2 cannot operate. Russia has the real resources. And what do they need? They don't need euros. Russia doesn't give a crap about euros. Russia doesn't need U.S. dollars. In fact, they said we won't take payment in dollars. So what are they doing? What exactly are they doing? Well, you've cut Russia off from the you know, SWIFT system. So Russia is saying, hey, payment systems be damned. We are only going to accept payment in our currency. What are they doing? They are literally telling the U.S. to go fuck itself. Is it going to work? Probably will. Probably will. Why? It's because they've got China, who would like very much not to have their economic status destroyed by this whole war with Russia and Ukraine. They're kind of trying to tread a level course, but China has never been afraid to side with Russia when it was in her best interest. So be wary of China, Russia, and India doing what they do to kind of support one another. That's an awful lot of people, folks. That's an awful lot of real resources, and that's an awful lot of geopolitical power waiting to be stored up against the United States and NATO and everyone else. That may be a good thing. It may be a bad thing. It's just the thing, and that's what we're reporting here. But either way, though, it's interesting because as Biden has sought to isolate Russia more, what they've done is they've proven the dollar hegemony, the hegemony of the dollar is the weapon, and they've known this. And what are they doing? They're taking great steps to detach from the United States payment system. And they're saying, we don't need you. We don't need you, and we don't need your money, and we don't need your uh, you know, payments clearing, because if we don't tell the line, you're just going to shut the door on us. So what Russia did was they took most of their reserves, not enough of them, obviously, for their own good. They took a lot of their reserves, pulled them back, and put them into gold. Well, what's the problem with that? Gold, you know, I mean, somebody's got to buy it, right? And so there's all this push to block Russian gold, but it's kind of hard to block a mineral, right? I mean, unless you've got some way of tracing it, which they can melt this stuff down, you can melt any gold currency down, turn it into bullion, and put it out there. Now, it's nowhere near enough. There's no way to launder that much through to make it worthwhile. But you've got that entire Eastern Bloc there working with each other. And I've said this before. I'll say it again. Russia is not a tiny place. They're not going to get claustrophobic. This is not going to create any kind of problem for them. The money part of this is almost irrelevant because they are a food sovereign. They are a energy sovereign. And they can pretty much do whatever they want to do. Without the United States' help, they really don't need us, and we haven't been much help to them to begin with. So it should be interesting to see how this plays out. But needless to say, Joe Biden has come out very ham-handed. They're out there trying to shut all the doors, trying to close all the windows, trying to throw the key in the trash to keep Russia out of the mix. Now, I don't know if there's any truth to this or not, but it sure feels an awful lot like Hillary Clinton is still trying to reclaim her loss to Donald Trump back in 2016. I mean, these things, it just feels weird, right? It feels weird that we would go to all this trouble to empower Russia to literally destabilize the United States position that it once held. It seems kind of insane that Biden would do such a thing. But then again, is it really even Biden pulling the strings on this? Who knows? Suffice it to say, though, I think that Biden has overplayed his hand significantly because at the end of the day, Russia doesn't need United States dollars. Russia doesn't need euros. What Russia needs is fuel, too. Russia might need grains. It might need other things. But guess what? They've got an asset, huge asset, an investment waiting to happen that is just sitting there. And it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Now, Putin has come out and said, that Russia will, in fact, honor the contracts that are already on the books. 
But those contracts that are already on the books, they're flipping around. They're saying, you got to pay in rubles. So keep your eyes on this one, folks. This one's going to get interesting. Next. In the United States, we have another situation going on, as if we don't have enough going on. In Russia, you've got the war with Ukraine. You've got us meddling there. You've got gas prices through the roof. You've got us still coming out of like supply chain hell over the pandemic. But simultaneously, you've got something else going on. We've seen the rent going up around the country, but we've got a new entry. This is not new, but it's really starting to become a problem. It wasn't enough for the rich to own mansions. It wasn't enough for them to own skyscrapers. No, folks. The rich, these investor-grade fuckfaces, are now starting to buy up motorhomes. Motorhomes, friends. They're starting to buy up the motorhomes. Why are they doing that? Well, if you understand real resources, land, they are buying up the land. And they can drive that price through the roof. They can sit there and raise rents. They can raise lot prices, et cetera. Folks, investment groups are buying up America. They're buying it everywhere. And they are inflating prices like never before. It's hard enough when you go out to San Francisco and you see folks lining up the streets in tent cities. San Francisco is priced out of anyone's price range. It has just a normal job. You can't even afford to live in San Francisco on a normal job. You have to have two or three jobs. It's insane. Now, in rural America, we had trailer parks, man. I mean, I remember getting kicked and teased and stuff like that for the poor kids. Well, I lived in a single wide once going through a divorce, and I got to tell you, it wasn't so horrible. I was shocked. It wasn't so horrible, right? Shit happens. People have to do what they have to do. There's nothing wrong with that until the cost of a trailer park becomes the cost of a freaking four bedroom, three bath kind of house in the suburbs. Folks, once these investors get in there, they've got one purpose and one purpose only. And no, I, I beg to differ with anyone that would take exception to this. They are not there to serve your needs. They are there simply to fatten their wallets. And as we've already seen through this crisis, the an economic crisis that we're in the middle of, we've already seen that when there's a chance of them to raise prices, regardless of costs, they are going to raise prices on you and I, period. That's the way it works. No getting around it. So what do you think is going to happen to mobile home living? Mobile home living, which had been the bastion, if you will, of all things that we've grown to know and love, everything that we've grown to know and love, it has literally been the one thing that you could fall back on was a mobile home. It was low cost. It was inexpensive. You could have dignity. You could still have running water and a bathroom, everything else. But lo and behold, America is for sale to the highest bidder. Neoliberalism on steroids. When you run out of health care to privatize, when you run out of every other public service to privatize, what the hell, why not start going after the mobile home community? And this is what they're doing. Next. As it stands right now, folks, what we have is a situation where the Federal Reserve is looking to raise interest rates, like the Volcker shock of the 80s. They are looking to stave off this inflation by raising interest rates. Now, good old school uh, neoclassical economists and people that have read the old Mankiw, Gregory Mankiw textbooks would sit there and think that, hey, raising interest rates is a thing and it's a good thing. Raising interest rates is nothing more than a basic income for the rich. It raises the cost of credit and it does exactly the opposite of actually impacting uh, inflation. What it does, it, by extension, is it ends up creating more inflationary problems or potentially even creating stagflation as people, regular Jane and Joe Sixpack, are not seeing a raise in their payments, their paychecks, I should say, but they are seeing a rise in the cost of living. And this, my friends, is definitely roots for stagflation. So what does Joe Biden think about this? Well, Joe Biden, being a good neoliberal, 
he's in the business of reaching out to you know President Manchin. President Manchin, who instead, instead of understanding economics, understands control of the capital class. So Biden, in all of his infinite wisdom, has put up a tweet proclaiming how excited he is that his budget plan will bring the deficit down by $1.3 trillion. $1.3 trillion, folks. This is the kind of brain-dead economic illiteracy that you can expect from a neoliberal trailer trash. The real trailer trash, right? Because they're the trash that goes out and buys the fucking trailer parks. Joe Biden is doing the typical dance that Bill Clinton did when he passed on... (gasps) A recession to George W. Bush? I bet you never hear that very often, do you? No, he is literally reducing the deficit. And once you reduce the deficit, you're reducing the money in the system. You are literally reducing economic activity. You are making it more and more and more difficult. And it just breaks down little by little with buying power decreasing. And the poor always end up carrying the freight no matter what. Because the rich are rich. They already got what they got. As you go down the chain, as you go down the further to see who's got more chains on them, who's more in debt, who's more struggling, that deficit reduction really begins to eat their soul alive. That is austerity. And that right there, my friends, is murder. But Joe Biden is appealing to Mr. Manchin, President Manchin, trying to get him to sign off on his budget. Now, Is there a way of going after the wealthy and trying to tackle some of that money that was spent during the pandemic that they literally stole from America? They literally just sucked it right up. Well, sure there is. But the problem is you need price controls and other things because they're going to claw back their losses. That's what they do. They're going to claw back their losses. So how does that work for me and you? Well, it doesn't. See, when, what happens is, is that when the government stops spending, you're left with very, very, very serious recessionary forces. And we were already looking at recessionary forces. We were already looking at calamitous times. We're already looking at the dog-eat-dog nature of a neoliberal hellscape that we're all living in. And anybody with a brain, with a brain, mind you, not, not, not a pea brain, but a brain brain, would know that in, at times like this, the most important thing to do is to spend, to make things easier to get to, to increase the supply chains, to robustly build up manufacturing, to do whatever it is you got to do to offset that. And that will bring prices down, potentially, because really a lot of this inflation isn't about anything other than price gouging. So what is the solution to price gouging? Well, you can certainly tax the bejesus out of them, but they'll pass that on if they're a business. But no, what Biden is going to do is he's going to put it on the backs of the little people because this is the neoliberal way. Now, if you want to take a look at this for your own self, all you have to do is look at when Bill Clinton sat there and had his surplus, had his balanced budget. The so-called Goldilocks economy. He had a disruptive force, a disruptive technology backing him up. The internet was booming. But right then and there, they cut too close to the bone. They eliminated so much help and welfare. They sat there and literally decimated single moms. And ultimately, in the end, in the end, brought on a recession. Bush, imagine feeling any pity at all for a war criminal like George W. Bush. George W. Bush, unfortunately, inherited worst archetypes for a recession ever because it wasn't just the immediate recession that he faced. It was also all the things that the repealing of Glass-Steagall did that created the grounds for the Great Recession that happened in 2008 and 2009. And we're still living in that. We're still not completely recovered from that. And now you've got, like in our previous story, 
You've got investors buying up the mobile homes. You got fuel prices up as a result of gouging and the games people play in the middle of the night with Russia and Ukraine. And all in all, we've got a global free for all to see who can make life more shitty for the rest of the regular people. So, with that, I'm Steve Grumbine. This was Let's Get Ready to Grumble. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. I'm out of here. Thanks for watching, and make sure to tune in to Status Coup's daily live stream. Monday through Thursday at 5 o'clock Eastern Time and Fridays at 4 o'clock Eastern Time.